All right, everyone, uh, welcome to IoT Live. Um, we already had a great session of uh, demos, so I recommend you check that out. And uh, really looking forward to the open hardware panel today. Uh, it's a great lineup. And uh, Ken from Tiny Circuits is going to start us off with uh, a talk, and we'll go through the speaker lineup and then have a, a Q&A and discussion following that from the audience. So uh, enjoy, and uh, talk to you soon. All right, hi everybody. This is Ken Burns from Tiny Circuits. It's really uh, quite my honor to be the the first speaker here today. It's something I'm really passionate about, both open hardware and the Internet of Things. And we'd really like to talk to you about a little bit about what we do and also what we kind of think uh, is the kind of future of open hardware in the Internet of Things, and uh, you know how these open hardware tools are going to really play into the space. So the company I founded is called Tiny Circuits. We're based out of Akron, Ohio. And it's uh, kind of a stretch, but we make uh, really small, <laughs> tiny circuits for for makers, students, artists, and hobbyists to, to really build things um, and uh, create their own projects or products. As I said, we're based in Akron. We're funded initially via Kickstarter, uh, like another uh, number of open hardware projects are. Our initial product is a derivative of the Arduino. We call it the Tiny Duino. And it's all open source, and so we we play, you know, this whole open source world as well. And the other thing is, we actually do manufacturing in house, so we're we're makers ourselves. So we make everything, you know, here in house in Akron, Ohio. Just a quick overview of the Tiny Duino and what we make and what we launched on Kickstarter. It's an Arduino compatible board, um, essentially an Arduino Uno, but it's the size of a quarter, and just like an Arduino. Uh, you can easily add expansion capabilities through the use of shields or tiny shields in our case. Almost like little electronic Legos, you can plug these different pieces together to create projects or products. And here's, hopefully this comes through, this little animated GIF of uh, just how the boards kind of stack together. The nice thing about the whole open hardware, open software world dealing with uh, in the, the maker space type uh, Arduino, Raspberry Pi world, is it's really easy for non-engineers or for different people to add very complex functions uh, into their projects. And so these are just a few different shields that we have, um, so like Wi-Fi, GPS, a number of different sensors, Ethernet. And again, from an Arduino standpoint and uh, also just an open hardware standpoint, these are all things that uh, people can use to enable you know, Internet of Things type projects. We can talk just a little bit about you know, we uh, kind of covered what we do, and now transitioning more into you know open hardware and kind of our thoughts on that. If we look back at just the standard internet, so you know we we're talking about the Internet of Things, but really it's all just one big internet. In the current internet that everyone's very familiar with, software, uh, there's a very large mix of closed and open source, and actually open source has made really huge leaps uh, since the 1980s, and you see quite a bit even all the way from the desktop all the way to uh, the network infrastructure layer. So you see a number of web servers, whether it's Apache, different operating systems with Linux variants and whatnot, and even the smartphone market with Android coming out, which is based on Linux, that there's really this open source software is making an incredible impact on, on the standard Internet as we know it. But right now, hardware is really dominated uh, by closed hardware solutions on the internet. At the at the very high end, you've got you know, your big players, your IBM, Cisco's, and whatnot. And there's very little in the way of open hardware, even down uh, with end users, whether it's a PC or a Mac that you're using uh, or a phone. Those are generally closed solutions coming from a particular company that you buy those from. But when we transition to the Internet of Things, at the network level, level, things really are pretty much the same. It's just there's a lot more devices connecting up to the Internet when we talk about these things. So just from my standpoint, don't really see much changing at that level. Still seeing proprietary closed solutions pretty much dominating that for the very near term, and actually likely for the far term. But when we get down to the device level, the true, the thing level, things greatly change. Uh, Things are a much simpler device, potentially, 
And there's, you know, what, what do we actually mean by a thing when we talk about the Internet of Things? There's quite a lot of uh, different possibilities. And just this huge variety. It's not just a computer anymore. It's not just your phone that you're connecting up to the Internet. It's all these little different, unusual, you know, type things that uh, people might be interested to get data off of or, um, you know, find out information about or be able to do remote control type applications. And the great thing from the open hardware world is there's a number of tools today, uh, whether it's an Arduino type system, or Raspberry Pi, other systems, and that fit perfectly into this world. And so certainly our, our primary focus is Arduino. And the great thing about open hardware is it really democratizes the Internet of Things and also hardware making and even uh, allowing people to make really low volume niche type project products. Definitely open hardware allows very rapid innovation. I mean, it, we launched on Kickstarter and you can go on Kickstarter pretty much any week and you'll find a different Arduino clone or different people doing open hardware type projects for unique purposes. And the great thing about that is that spurs more ideas and more people can build upon that, share ideas, share the resources, and build upon that technology extremely quickly. Whereas if it's a closed solution, you wouldn't get nearly that level of innovation. And the other really cool thing about using these sorts of tools for an end user or maker is now it's not just corporations that are really dictating what goes onto the internet or how people interact in terms of a hardware standpoint. End users or makers can really you know, design their own projects or products that can live in this whole infrastructure of the Internet of Things. And you can even create, whether it's a, a one-off application or a very low volume type thing, uh, design products and solutions that really uh, solve real world, pro real world problems where a corporation or a government might look at that completely differently. And one great case of this was uh, one of the first things I've heard along this lines with the Tokyo hackerspace after the Fukushima disaster a few years ago uh, created um, some radiation detectors that uh, is all open source based, kind of Arduino based. There's a, a well-known hacker, Akiba, out of uh, Tokyo that has his own site called uh, FreakZ. And so he did some open source wireless sensor networks and he really kind of spearheaded this project along with the Tokyo Hackerspace to put radiation detectors very cheaply using open source solutions around um, the eastern part of Japan to create allow citizens to actually monitor radiation levels in their in their area, contribute to that to the internet. And so that's one of those really interesting type projects that open hard hardware kind of allows people to create very complicated things simply, share the data. And so we really see open hardware at the device level in the Internet of Things being being a really you know a huge motivator and allowing people to you know create very interesting and, and great applications. So that's, that's all I have, and I look forward to hearing everybody else's uh, talks today and participate in the panel later in the session. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Ken. I appreciate it. Um, you mentioned the Fukushima uh, sensors. Have you had any uh, interesting projects come through for some of the tiny Duino lately? Yeah, there's been a number of people using our Wi-Fi for home automation type sensors, so that's kind of what people would normally think of. But we've had uh, a university, this isn't necessarily an Internet of Things type application, um, but they're doing, it's Northwestern University, they're doing underwater cave research where they're monitoring the, the currents in and out of cave systems in Mexico. And so using our system, they were able to create a system that replaced basically a $20,000 piece of equipment with a few hundred dollar pieces of equipment that they could build themselves, almost a citizen scientist type role and be able to monitor different cave systems, leave these down under, in underwater caves for a year, collect tidal data out of this. And so it's really an interesting application of uh, what they were doing. Huh. Very cool. Yeah, well, let's continue this conversation uh, after the, the rest of the panel. Um, I think uh, Emil is, it should be uh, coming up in a second, but we're actually going to go to uh, Daniel from Ninja Block. So, um, Daniel? Thank you. Uh very much for sort of inviting us to have a chat at this open hardware. It's, um, yeah, uh, 
very exciting. I'll try and keep mine a bit shorter so we can try and stay on time a bit. Um, so we're I'm from a company called Ninja Blocks. Um, we launched uh, originally by Kickstarter in January 2012. Um, the original idea for Ninja Blocks was a completely open system that allowed people who were trying to use Arduino but finding it a bit more difficult than they would like an easier way to interact with devices and hardware uh, using software stacks that they were sort of m more used to, things like HTTP and um, sort of more sort of web software engineers. And sort of by launching, the idea was sort of to provide an if this, then that for devices. Um, what we did the, later on that year is we sort of repackaged this into more of a developer kit and started really sort of build out and understand the concept of what Internet of Things was. Um, and what uh, connectivity for devices were, uh, because there were so many uh, entering the market constantly, um, and you know what did automation mean? What was connecting to a device like? There was already tons of different protocols and devices, so we really wanted to try and understand it by building out a horizontal platform that allowed almost anybody to pick something up, connect it to the internet, and control it really simply. Um, what we did was we were interacting constantly with people via our forums, um, and that allowed us to be able to really see what people were trying to use devices for, what kind of automation they were trying to do, um, what kind of, kind of control they were trying to do, and what devices they were trying to control. And there was a lot of recurring themes that were quite sort of missed uh, in a lot of the uh, a lot of the sort of projects and solutions out there. So what we did was we wrapped all of this up into our most recent Kickstarter, uh, the Ninja Sphere which is trying to be sort of a clever evolution from blocks to spheres, and really try and build a more of a consumer product or something that somebody could put in their home and really interact with their devices and, um, you know, your average person could benefit from sort of the pain that all of our developers were having and we were trying to solve and they were trying to solve. Um, so, you know, I think what we sort of had, if you look at the products of our, of our company, is sort of a real sort of evolution towards more of a, a sleeker looking device, but still trying to main com remain completely open. Uh, the the Ninja Block, the hardware casings, the designs, all of the software completely open source. Ditto for the developer kit, um, and we're moving that way as well for the Ninja Sphere um, once we sort of get through certification. Um, we've also launched a, a Raspberry Pi uh, cape, and the goal there was to be able to plug any Arduino shield onto a Raspberry Pi to provide a really thin layer that would be able to get any Arduino shield onto the internet. And we've released almost well, all of these designs, the PCB documents, the schematics, the files for um, all of the casings. We've released these all on our GitHub because we essentially had nowhere better to put it, really. Um, so this is the first place because all of our code was living here. And that's sort of been you know, a, a quite an interesting thing for us because what we've realized is electrical collabor collaboration is hard. Um, we're seeing a, a lot of amazing stuff happen in the, in the world of plastics and housings. Um, a lot of 3D printers, but not a lot is happening really. Or there's no, you know, you wouldn't call the electrical PCB design revolution a thing. The biggest problem that we've sort of, sort of found out was as we're going through this, you know, design tools are expensive or inaccessible. Um, there's a lot of great stuff you can get free, like Eagle, for example, but it, it lacks a lot of features that designers and engineers want to use to be able to build these things. Um, so it's quite difficult for somebody to, you know, who's, who's able to design, you know, it, it seems sort of a, a bit out of place um, for them. Uh, collaboration doesn't really exist. Um, it's, you know, from what we've seen time and time again, really, is that somebody, by and large, they're a single or one or two designers will design a PCB, and that that's what it is. They'll put the schematics up maybe to GitHub or something like that, um, and it just sits there and sort of collects dust, essentially. And Manufacturing itself is, is, is quite a bit of a pain. There are now uh, a whole swag of companies who are, um, will be able to do sort of PCBA or uh, PCB uh, manufacture and assembly for quite low quantities, but you have to sort of know who they are and go and seek them out. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a world away from what we're seeing with the 3D printing world where you can go into Thingiverse, download a design, click play, go get a cup of coffee, watch a movie, and come back, and it, you know, depending on what it is, could be finished. And, you know, we think the key sort of driver that needs to happen, or the thing that's kind of missing to sort of continue to, to drive this 
uh, what could be a potentially a revolution in, uh, you know, another revolution just like 3D printing was for manufacturer PCB and electronics is, you know, just like we've seen with 3D printing, the tools will follow when people are able to manufacture easily. So what we're excited for and what we'd really like to see is, you know, something, a, a open source hardware GitHub like equivalent that, um, uh, and people are sort of attacking this upvote as one, and there's a few others that we've heard recently that are launching to be the hardware Kickstarter. But we'd love to see, you know, integration with a whole bunch of manufacturers, so that you're able to go and order something off of GitHub to be manufactured and delivered to your door really easily, uh, to be able to at least try and manufacture these yourself. What we are seeing right now is, as well, is sort of just like 3D printers being able to be run on a desktop. They, you know, we, we think. Uh, a lot is going to happen when people are able to purchase and manufacture things on their desktop. Um, there's art companies who are doing desktop 3D printers. Um, Othermachine.co is an example. They're, they're, they're aiming to build a desktop PCB manufacturer. Um, there's another company, the name escapes me right now, who are building desktop pick and place machines um, as well. And really, when we're able to sort of download a design, print it, manufacture it, I think that's when we, we will start seeing a lot of the tools sort of follow suite to allow the sort of collaboration that's um, happened um, in, you know, traditionally the software world, now in 3D printing of plastics. Um, and that's sort of a world that we're really, really quite excited for. We, as a company, would love the ability to put up a new design for a, 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 a temperature sensor or a motion sensor or something online, and people manufacture it themselves in their home and sort of cut out the middleman. Um, that's sort of a world that we would love to be able to live in. Now, there's a question on certification there, uh, and what I mean by that is regulatory requirements. We're going through a lot of pain right now in certifying our device to be able to ship into the European markets, US, UK, Australia, all of this, and there's a lot of stringent requirements um, <clears throat> placed on companies right now. I think it's going to be turned completely on its head when, when we're able to have individuals print electronics that's able, that are able to run probably low power um, initially on their home. and. To, the, the stringency around emissions requirements and things like that. It's going to be an incredibly interesting world to live in, and I, I, I don't think that's very far off. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we're really excited for what's, what's happening right now and what's going to happen, uh, but wish there was uh, the ability to collaborate far more. Um, and uh, that, that's sort of, I guess, my message for uh, my talk. That's great, Daniel. I really appreciate it. Um, it would be exciting to see... Uh, what happens with the sphere? I, I'm not sure how much you can uh, talk about at the moment, but actually we can follow up with that in the panel. Um, mm -hmm. Up next is Emil, who has a uh, from Tindy, who's the CEO and founder of Tindy, and it's uh, kind of a market for makers, so it has a lot of um, interactions with people who are dealing with some of these small batch manufacturing processes, and probably be some of the first to join in on these new. Um, services and products that uh, hopefully will speed up this hardware revolution that you guys are all uh, at the forefront of. So, so yeah, so I'm Emil. Um, I'm the CEO founder of Tindy, and so this is kind of a talk on what's happening in open hardware and kind of what are we seeing um, as a marketplace for indie electronics uh, basically around the world. So I think the, the main thing um, that most people kind of jump into this thinking is uh, is kind of pretty similar to this quote from Chris Dixon, which is many important new inventions start out looking like toys. And I think a lot of people when they first see what's happening with the Internet of Things, with this kind of new hardware movement, a lot of people don't get it because it's very, very new. Uh, and it's very raw and the the people that are trying right now, I think, are, are at the very beginning and the for, very forefront. And I think that's to be expected to, for things to be in a, in a very raw and, and, and new state. Um, but that's a good thing because uh, it produces basic platforms like Arduino. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's probably how most people get into uh, electronics these days in terms of DIY hacking and, and producing projects that they themselves are working on. Um, Arduino obviously has done a great job in terms of uh, paving the way for the last 10 years and it's really set kind of this trend on fire uh, where people are able to come up with new and interesting ideas uh, connected to the network and, and really get that idea out into the world whether it's on Tindy or, or another platform. Uh, 
the, the basic creativity that's there has basically streamed from anything from you know c connecting your lights, uh, different audio projects, different light sensors, different light you know platforms, etc. And and this is kind of what what I was noticing uh, coming up was a lot of these projects are are really exciting, really innovative, and they really don't have a place to live. And and I thought that's the huge opportunity, uh, seeing as the growth is just out of control. Um, the Raspberry Pi and Arduino are just on a tear right now, and BeagleBone's getting started. Uh, but this is not going away anytime soon, and people are getting into building their own electronics and getting those projects out into the world. And so some of some of the other speakers talking about open hardware as the way to basically pave that road uh, is 100% correct because it's allowing people to obviously build on top of the work of previous uh, engineers and get the, use, utilize their work um, for their own personal projects. So the idea was uh, what if we built a marketplace where people could come and just share what they're working on and see if other people wanted to buy and sell it. So uh, I, I threw the question up on Reddit as uh, just a, basically an open question. No code had been written, nothing had been made. Would anybody support a uh, marketplace for people to post their projects that they're coming up with and, and other people can buy and sell them? And so the, the response was super positive. So I basically started coding the site that day, quit my job a few months later, and so we're almost two years later, and, uh, and Tindy is alive and well. So uh, I think that the prototypical story for what's happening in and what's going on with Tendi and I think what's going on with, with open hardware can really be summed up with one project that we have which is called AirPi. So uh, these are the creators, Alyssa and Tom, uh, when uh, they... Neil, created... Hello? Sorry, to inter... sorry to interrupt you right there. Uh, we actually lost your screen share. Should you mind um, checking that for us real quick? There we go. It looks like it's up. All right, you're back. So. Uh, this is Alyssa and Tom. Uh, they came up with AirPies, a science project for their school science fair. And the idea is uh, a shield for Raspberry Pi to detect weather basically as cheaply as possible and as, as easy as possible. So it's a board that basically you plug into Raspberry Pi and it has sensors for things like CO2, uh, humidity, uh, barometric pressure, temperature, sound, etc. And that was it. It was a science fair project. It was really neat, really exciting. However, uh, once they basically got it out into the world, uh, the reaction was a little bit, I guess, unexpected in terms of how they thought people would uh, react. And so here's the, the finished board that they produced. Uh, it, the second version's on the way. But what started as a simple science fair project, they posted on Tindy, and, and now they're shipping tens of thousands of dollars of those a month. And uh, they're off and running, and they just turned 18, and they're still in high school, and they're basically got a, an exciting project where people are sharing their local weather, uh, and, and the whole network is actually tied together on, on the AirPrice site. So it's very much like a... a very, very cheap DIY weather underground where all of these nodes together are creating a, a unified weather picture, but all from a simple $90 board that you just attach to a Raspberry Pi. And I think that the, the exciting part about this is the amount of interest is not just at the hobby level, and it's not just going from you know projects coming off of Kickstarter or people trying to build these really you know large companies off of it, but they... Traditional companies are also really getting excited, as well as anything down to you know education and universities. So we've got people buying uh, parts, basically Google, Intel, NASA, Beats Headwear, but also universities, University of Maryland, California, MIT, you name it. Uh, and that's, I think, the, the exciting thing is that it's not just one group of people, but uh, basically a lot of people are diving in at the same time, which is producing interesting results. And the one that I think is... One of the most interesting is Open Compute, from which Facebook started, and the idea being that if they share how they're building their servers and their, their back-end infrastructure, uh, the rest of the web actually benefits, and 
uh, the efficiencies that they've seen by opening that up and allowing everyone to collaborate on their their infrastructure have seen I think 38 40 percent efficiencies um, in energy use and the amount of uh, energy it takes to power uh, a traditional data center which I think is ex extremely exciting for a company that's at that scale to release their uh, the schematics and to release the basically the the guts of, of what's going on behind the scenes because at the end of the day everyone benefits and it basically creates a much stronger lighter web um, which everyone can benefit from by just a monster company releasing releasing this type of information and so I think that the, the key message is this change is happening but it's not just happening in garages it's not just happening on Kickstarter it's not just happening on Tindy it's basically the entire spectrum you have kids as young as you know Tom and Alyssa who are, are still in school and you have the, the biggest companies in the world saying uh, there's something in the waters changes here and we want to participate because we can tell that this is the future a lot of it is clearly not set in stone but you might as well start to pay attention because what's happening and what's getting defined right now is going to have a, a very real impact on the years ahead so we're excited to basically be a part of that and to share kind of uh, a platform where people can get their projects into the world. Uh, and I think it's going to be really exciting over the next few years to see how this evolves because we're, we're very much still in the early, early days. And a lot's going to get sorted and a lot's going to get set. But uh, the, the creativity and, and the, the innovation that's going to happen is truly, truly exciting. So that's really my talk. Um, th thanks, guys. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but I guess one thing is um, we're, we're going to be releasing some, some new features here in the future. Uh, if you'd like to get some early access, attendee.com uh, slash secret, and just use the code IOT Live early access. So thanks, guys. Up next, we have uh, Paul Hopkin, who's the chief engineer at Relayer, who also just announced and launched through uh, Dragon Innovation, their crowdfunding platform, their Wonder Bar. Uh, hardware set, which also enables some of these makers to make their own projects. So, Paul? Hi, everybody. So, as I said, I'm Paul Hopson from Relayer. So, we're a Berlin-based startup founded last year by a bunch of uh, software guys, so internet software guys. And uh, I figured it might be entertaining to share uh, the journey that we had as we launched our Wonderbar product. Um, I've got this working title, so a work of staggering genius, stolen from David Eggers. So, staggering meaning not a necessarily astonishing or shocking, um, but definitely moving forward in an unsteady way as if we might fall at any moment. Uh, maybe some of you have had the same experience. So we started off with this kind of business vision for the Wonder Bar. So here it is, you can see it on the screen. We wanted to build kind of uh, not just the Wonder Bar, we wanted to build a platform for the Internet of Things uh, and build an ecosystem of things that would start connecting to that platform because we felt that there was still so much kind of uh, PowerPoint talk about the Internet of Things and not really enough happening, and we wanted to take, we wanted to do our part in turning that thing into reality. Um, so part of this idea of an ecosystem was we build a piece of hardware that would be Arduino compatible, but somehow at the same time would also be a reference design, also a rapid development kit, uh, and everything would work with Wi-Fi. Um, but we kind of then had our kind of first roadblocks. Uh, we started off with our first hardware team. Um, they were kind of like really nice guys that we met, but they wouldn't use mobile phones. And they'd only do email through PGP. They wouldn't actually tell us where they lived. And uh, yeah, they wouldn't discuss the time plan either. Um, so after after a couple of months, we had to stop working, which was kind of tough because then we had no hardware guys. Then we turned out that our um, then it turned out that our idea of kind of like a smart Arduino unit, uh, which would be Wi-Fi enabled, was already made by Sparkor. In fact, they'd made it fantastically. Uh, we were really excited to see it, but of course a bit disappointed as well. Once we started looking at the at the Sparkor and this design, we realized some of our own shortcomings. So Wi-Fi is not really that great. Um, the chips are relatively expensive still. Um, you can't use it everywhere. Um, and then once we started looking at the units and kind of blocking things together, we realized that we'd end up with these kind of relatively blocky units, whereas our vision of sensors for the Internet of Things would be kind of tiny, tiny little things that we could stick on door handles, uh, on sofas, uh, on your clothes. So we kind of had the feeling that maybe Wi-Fi wasn't the answer. We had a rethink and started thinking about lots of small sensors connecting using Bluetooth LE, 
And then we'd have something like a master module, which would gather that data. Uh, but also mobile devices would also be able to gather that data. Uh, and then we'd be able to send it up to our cloud platform, a solution, obviously using MQTT. Um, and this was our kind of, uh, this was our initial thought, our initial idea. And we first really realized we started talking about this kind of uh, on the 15th of October last year. That's the first email I found. Another fundamental, another fundamental part in our strategy shift here was that we decided that actually there is so much stuff out there already catering to makers and hackers. We increasingly started speaking to app developers, uh, so guys making apps for smartphones, and they all bought Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, but they were kind of they were just gathering dust. Those guys were kind of frustrated because beyond getting things to blink, they weren't able to build the kind of big visions that they had in their mind. So we figured that these guys would be um, a target that's not really being addressed at the moment. So we wanted to talk to them. So from this initial hardware design, sorry, from this initial hardware concept and the first bits of design, then we kind of started working together with two fantastic uh, product designers. We'd already started talking about blocks of chocolate, and these are the first renderings that they came up with. Orig originally, we wanted to call it the KitKat kit, um, but then with the Android KitKat release, we decided it was a bad idea, and then switched to the name Wonderbar. This also let us move on to our next uh, development phase. Uh, we started working with a new hardware team, um, so they were an external company, um, uh, but they were great. Um, we really wanted to kind of get something ready, a first prototype ready before Christmas, and they were fantastic. We all worked together days and nights to get everything ready, and indeed, we got our first prototype ready in time to launch our crowdfunding campaign. This is when we thought we were going to launch it. It didn't quite happen. Uh, we prepared everything for Kickstarter, and we wanted to launch two weeks before Christmas. But lots of press attention and social networking, prototype was ready. We made a video, and we absolutely hated it. So we made a second video, and we were happy. So we sent everything off to Kickstarter and we waited, and they finally gave us approval to launch on the 23rd of December. So we said, well, that's not such a great idea. So we waited until January. Um, and whilst we were waiting, uh, we got contacted uh, by Dragon Innovation. So they are kind of they they market themselves as a Kickstarter for hardware, and we, they they kind of persuaded us that their quality kind of quantity approach would really suit us because we were really not such a, a great hardware team. They offered to give us a lot of support, and it worked great for us. They put us in touch with a lot of really great people, and we got a lot of, a lot of nice press. So Tech TechCrunch twice, Fast Company, Engadget, Gizmag, NextWeb, a lot of people. It was fantastic. And so we finally finished the crowdfunding campaign last month, March the 4th. We managed to get 122% of our target, which was really great. But this whole process has kind of taught us that, as we all know, as you guys all know, uh, hardware really is hard, especially if you come from software. So iterations are kind of crazy slow. Deployment of, uh, as Daniel was talking about, deployment of PCB taking two, three weeks is, is insane. Uh, and then all of these nice things that you think you're going to put on the board turn out not to be available. And then the pricing, because you're doing Kickstarter, you don't know if you're going to need 100, 1,000, or 10,000. So you can't do any realistic pricing. You're just doing guesswork. Um, so this was our first lesson. Uh, and then we started thinking about firmware, and there's a whole lot more things to learn. I'll come to that. So during the during the end phases of the campaign, we got contacted by a couple of different um, distributors, and one of them was based in Germany, the same as we are, called Comrade. And they made us really they made us a really great offer to do European distribution, um, and also do the manufacturing for us. And what was really valuable is they're going to they decided they would help us do some of the board revisions because some of the components we'd identified in our in our first and second prototypes just turned out to be unavailable. And for us to produce open hardware with components that you can't get hold of was kind of crazy as well. Um, so we've now got a new hardware team, uh, external, so which is uh, paid for and managed by Comrade, which is fantastic. But that's also given us the uh, courage to actually try again to have another in-house hardware team, and that's working out really great. Um, it's also been really great working with them because they get us good deals on parts and put us in a position where we can start talking to chip manufacturers. And I guess our next prototype is going to be out in two to three weeks. Um, 
So, and it turns out that open source is really hard too. So I know open source software, and that was really easy. That was kind of fun. Uh, but open source hardware, if you move off of the kind of standard Arduino circuit, it gets to be really tough, especially if you're not a hardware specialist. Um, so again, finding parts uh, still stays tough. Uh, tool chains, uh, all these proprietary tool chains, which you have to kind of try and work around. Um, then things like physical, uh, like flashing and debugging devices that you have to kind of get from somewhere, and also completely proprietary. We're having to kind of work with people to now see how we can kind of remove some of these obstacles to start using some of that chipset. Um, I mean, we've made our layouts and schemas for the PCBs open, but, but we will be doing it once we've launched, and the firmware, we can only still make partially open at the moment. We're trying to work with a couple of the manufacturers, we're working with Freescale to see which, how we can leverage their tool chain to be free instead of costing $10,000. But it's a work in progress. Um, we're going to be delivering by the end of June, uh, for sure. Uh, lots of parts are going to be uh, open, uh, but probably not all of it. But we're hoping by October that we'll actually be able to make everything work and be able to share it with everybody. Anyway, that was my little status report. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. That was pretty interesting and a uh, pretty fast timeline, really. Um, so next up, we have David from Cooking Hacks. Thank you very much for for the opportunity of uh, making this presentation. Uh, hi, everyone. This is David Bordonada from Cooking Hacks. I am the key account manager. Uh, for everyone, uh, Cooking Hacks is. Uh, uh, an open division of the company and our CEO, Ali Yassin, uh, will talk uh, later about the business in the Internet of Things. Cooking Arts is an, uh, is an online retail store that brings the Internet of Things to everyone by making electronics affordable, easy to learn, and fun. The name of Cooking Arts uh, comes because we think that electronics is as easy as cook. You need ingredients, you follow the steps like in a recipe, and finally, you get a final product. You can see in this basic equation, uh, this is uh, the evolution in the last years of how the open source uh, hardware is, uh, entering, is introducing in this new market for making emerging uh, companies. Okay? Open source hardware plus sensors plus connectivity and plus crowdsourcing makes new ideas that evolves to new products, making new categories of solutions, bringing by, the, by new companies. When, should, when you search the, in Google and the information about maker, maker movement, the maker, uh, you can find uh, terms like that from the open source, blacksmith, <laughs> MacGyver, hackerspace. It's very, it's very actual in this in this moment. A maker is a handy people who make solutions by themselves using some tools like uh, wood or electronics or metal. And Arduino is the new tool that makers are using for making the solutions for uh, the new the new problems nowadays. Uh, the electronic makers uh, makes uh, use the Arduino, the Arduino device, in order to make new projects. It's a basic tool for electronics and for programming. Easy to program because it's in C++. It's uh, C++. And also not only for engineers, but for uh, makers uh, for producing digital art or whatever you want. Cooking Ads is uh, helping the Arduino community with uh, providing some shields for this uh, uh, for this platform. Arduino is an open source hardware, so all the design is open. So Cooking Ads, uh, with this philosophy, uh, opens the schematics of their their shields to the public. So anyone can bring these schematics and make the the board. Like the, like the Arduino. In the picture, you can see that we also uh, were focusing the wireless communications like TV, Bluetooth, GPRS, uh, GPS. There's uh, another one like 3G. 
and the new wireless communication that uh, we will we will launch in the next months. And also another boards for final solutions like radiation sensor shield or e-health. The technology has never been so done. In cooking guts, uh, we think that the children are the future. Uh, nowadays, uh, people uh, from uh, schools here in, in Spain and also in, in Europe and worldwide uh, are using new open source software in the schools. From children, uh, terms like Linux, GIMP, Scratch are commonly used in the, in the school. And right now, Cooking Arts brings some workshops in the schools in order to teach Arduino, Arduino programming, and soldering, and electronics in general to the kids. As you can see in the picture, there are two, two guys from, from Cooking Arts team and teaching the, the children, so I, they are very happy about that. <laughs> A shield that uh, was named in, the, in some slides uh, ago was the radiation shield. This shield was uh, made in order to uh, measure the radioactivity after the uh, Fukushima disaster, in order to uh, measure by themselves, by the citizens, the values of the radioactivity in, in the environment, in order to compare the results with the ones bring by the TV or the radio. So this is an example of how one maker from uh, from Japan uh, used uh, our radiation sensor shield and put uh, these values in the in Pachube in in the cloud through through Pachube now safely. After that, we work uh, with NanoSatisfy in Arduzat project, making the board smaller and it was launched to the International Space Station and right now it's orbiting our nose. This is uh, another example of how open hardware has become a final product or a part of a final, a final project. And this uh, is another example of uh, open hardware. It's the uh, EHEL sensor platform for the Arduino Recovery Pi. This shield was uh, launched in 2012 by cooking uh, team in order to measure your body with uh, biometric sensors. Uh, what we do, what we did uh, was uh, to use commercial sensors and we hacked them in order to uh, send the information from the sensor to the Arduino or Raspberry Pi uh, platform using this, uh, this shield. So the, the results was the we were finalists uh, in post case awards in 2012 and also in uh, James, uh, James Dyson awards and with this shield we with this shield uh, we will uh, we will refer it in in wire with an article about that about how to me measure the biometric sensors uh, the bi biometric measurements and share the information with using also open open hardware, and right now uh, this is uh, a, a basic example of how uh, a, a company called uh, Inspire is uh, based in a project hub for the third world are using this uh, this shield in order to prototype a new solution for measuring the pneumonia in babies. The project is called Inspire and. Mike Script from from this uh, company will talk about uh, about that in Maker Fair in Bay Area the next month. So if you take the opportunity, you can you can hear about that. And not to find not to finish uh, our slide, we've been the the opportunity of of see all the uh, commercial or all the companies that use uh, what that start using the open source hardware. Uh, in the first column, you can see mm, very well-known companies like Free Robotics, Labelium, Nanosatisfy, or even that uh, become, uh, start with uh, some uh, open source hardware projects and finally are using commercial products based in, in prototypes of uh, open source hardware. 
Then the 3D printer world, like uh, 3D systems, MakerBot, PinterBot, all of them uh, were based in were based in open source hardware designs. There is another special mention for enable the makers. Uh, These uh, companies makes uh, the opportunity to the makers to use some shields to provide solutions for new problems using the open source hardware. Adafruit, Arduino, Pinax, and Seed Studio, for example. There are some companies that uh, are launching every month uh, some new solutions based for the new open source hardware uh, devices. And don't forget to special mention for maker communities like Hackaday, Instable, or Make. Uh, there are some blocks for this maker movement in order to teach uh, people uh, how to use uh, the open hardware and electronics to everyone. And finally, the consumer end like Oculus, People, or Square were uh, starting like an open source hardware and also for Kickstarter projects. So it's a uh, startups born from makers and uh, for open, from open hardware. So don't don't forget to meet us at Maker Fair Bay Area yeah, because uh, we were there in 17 and 18 of May in 2014. So if you take the opportunity, you can visit us and we will show more, more and more uh, products and projects that we are uh, using for the maker movement. Thank you very much for for seeing the, the slides. Thanks, David. Um, so we have about 10 minutes now for a, a little bit of a panel discussion. And I, I just wanted to, uh, David, follow up on your your last slide there showing kind of the the whole maker ecosystem and this, um, I think there's something tangible that this group is at the forefront of from open hardware, prototyping, crowdfunding, and kind of new business models. So I just wanted to, um, we also have a question for the audience and I think just how do you guys see collaboration um, moving forward from both open hardware and then also kind of this Internet of Things focused community. So I want to just open that up to the to the all the okay. panel just to see your thoughts on that. So feel free to turn. Yeah. The the for example for the radiation shield, it was a, a good example of uh, how uh, open hardware and also the community is very very strong in this, day, in this moment. Uh, when we uh, launched the radiation sensor shield. We have no idea of radioactivity of making some bigger sensors. So we post in, in our blog what we are going to do. And we start to receive uh, some information, some feedback from uh, makers, from teachers of high schools about uh, the radiation, the radiation uh, values and which uh, products uh, must as uh, we use in, in the project for, for the radiation censorship. And after, uh, uh, and after launching the first batch of the radiation censorship, we started to, to receive more, more feedback about improving, improving this, uh, this because we uh, upload the schematics. And, and finally, uh, the, the makers improving the, the shield also. So the second batch uh, of the radiation sensor shield includes, will uh, include the, the new improvements from the, from the makers. This is how the maker movement and, and companies are very, very strong. Okay, okay great. Uh, does anyone else want to chime in both on just collaboration or just this uh, yeah, collaboration potential across this group, um, potentially, or the ecosystem moving forward. Um, for example, the L, L in the radiation sensor field, okay, we didn't put an LCD, so uh, the makers improved the new shield with including this LCD in the top of the of the shield. For example, was uh, something that uh, we missed it in the in the first release, and after that, uh, with this improvement, we put it in an 
we take notes about that and uh, release the second patch with with this improvement. Uh, Emil, can you chime in maybe on what this looks like from maybe the the higher level as when you're engaging um, kind of at the end of the spectrum from the marketplace on what that would look like? Sorry, I think I caught the, the, the not the front end of the question. The front marketplaces and what? Maybe can you just chime in on how you see what collaboration looks like? Um, yeah. So I think that the, the, from a project standpoint, I think that there's obviously going to be some notion of a, a GitHub for hardware, like Daniel had said earlier. Um, I think that that will exist. In terms of collaboration and bringing products to market and getting uh, products out into the world, um, you know, I, I don't know exactly how that collaboration will work. Um, something that I, I am interested in kind of hearing some other people's thoughts are, are um, on the crowdfunding, which it seems like most of the people that have launched products out there in this panel have done. Would they do crowdfunding again? And I think Daniel, obviously, they just did another round of crowdfunding, so that's a yes, I think. Uh, and the other folks, I'm not sure what their thoughts are on on using it. Um, I was at EE Live last week, and the response from many of the speakers that had just done successful Kickstarters was, "No, we would not um, do another crowdfunding campaign because of." A variety of reasons, but it'd be interesting to hear kind of what other people thought on that as a as a viable way of kind of launching their IoT project out there into the wild. Well, I can speak a bit to that, um, just because we went through and obviously did our Tiny Duino crowdfunding campaign almost uh, well, it's a year and a half ago now. Yeah, <clears throat> and we ha we have some ideas for other things, and I mean there are crowdfunding isn't necessarily the the greatest thing. Certainly, once you've been through it, you've kind of learned some major pain that go along with it. But we'd certainly consider it again. It's um, just from a, a marketing standpoint, it's great to get the products out there and also get feedback. That being said, there are there's definitely some downsides to it. But we'd definitely be uh, interested in doing it again. We have another product kind of in the works that we'll probably go that route with. I I think. Yeah, so when, once we started doing our crowdfunding campaign, we were full of these ideas, these business ideas of uh, product validation. So if everybody hates it, that hates it, then uh, they're right. We shouldn't make it. But then actually, the pro the whole process to get enough attention to get people to come there and to support it in the first place doesn't really have much to do with market validation anyway. Um, I mean, I think we'd definitely do it again as well for the marketing purposes, just to really kind of get the attention that you do get when you're doing crowdfunding. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of a tough nut. And as I said, our, our our naive idea that product validation was something you got from doing a crowdfunding campaign is something we don't really feel was true. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Daniel, do you, do you want to chime in on maybe the yeah, difference I'll, from your first campaign to this this latest? Yeah, I mean, we've just recently done a second one. Um, so obviously, as Emil said, our answer was yes. Um, I think it depends on the nature of the product um, and what you're trying to sell um, because I think uh, Kickstarter has been used as something to sell a product that should quite rightfully have been built up over time over something like Tindy, which is starting small. Um, I do have a lot of cynicism uh, because we know all the pain around hardware startups launching in Kickstarter, especially the ones that want to ship certified products that have like a $15,000, you know, uh, you know, requirement of funding, and you're looking at that, and you're thinking, there's absolutely no way that's actually the number you're looking for, right? Um, so there's, um, you know, there, I think crowdfunding campaigns are great, but it, it, it is the nature of the product you're trying to launch. Um, what was great for us is we did need some of that market validation, um, that was sort of public demonstrated market validation, um, which kind of gets everything into momentum because you have a lot of people backing your campaign. Everything from you know you, the employees to your partners to your manufacturers, everyone gets excited and gets behind it. Um, so there's sort of other benefits there that you sort of reap from doing a, something that is a runaway success. But um, yeah, it, it's uh, 
there's there's no right answer. I think it depends on what you're trying to do and the nature of your product. Now, now tying a little bit into your talk on on some of these new manufacturing techniques and some of these new online services that are helping open hardware kind of um, get into this next stage. Um, do you see that being a, a part of this crowdfunding process, or not even crowdfunding necessarily, but this uh, new business creation? Um, and what kind of time frame do you do you see this taking part in? Um, I'd like to say I, I, I hope for the next couple of years we'll really sort of see it come into its own. But um, you know, I, I think 3D printing, for example, is, is sort of a great example of something that is quite rightfully going gangbusters. There's a lot of collaborative tools. There's online editors. There's online CAD programs, um, and something like Thingiverse is absolutely amazing. Um, which we don't necessarily see, we, you just download and print. I think we will see something like that for electronics um, over time and somebody is able to actually start printing devices. Um, there's logistical problems around that. I mean, you're not going to have the components. You'll still have to order out for the components um, for them as well. Um, but I guess what I was trying to convey was that um, we won't see any sort of revolution until the tools are there for assisting in collaboration and being able to manufacture a device easily. And the tools follow the means of production. Um, so you had 3D printers, and then you had the great tools that followed them to allow people to manufacture easy. Um, so it, I think it, it's really up on the, the cost of these devices. And if people, if this is something that is, is exciting to people, uh, you know, I think it is. 3D printers were pushed down, and people bought them originally for the so you, your innovators and quote unquote geeks who are just really excited about printing something in their home. I think we'll see that same trend uh, for PCB manufacturing in the home um, and uh, the, the tools will follow and I think that's when we'll start seeing the ability to collaborate on these things. Ken or Paul, have you guys used any of these new tools in your prototyping or? No, uh, we wish you had. Um. Oh, uh, well, we have, we're certainly aware of some of the things out there we kind of went a different route and actually uh, bought our own SMT line, and so we're doing that here. So we're certainly aware of the pains. And certainly 3D printing is great, uh, kind of a, a prototype path, the way to go, although hardware design, electronic hardware design, uh, there's a lot of complexities there, like uh, certainly the components, uh, the board fabrication. Um, I th I think it's going to be more of a, a third-party type of approach, such as um, an upverter or circuit hub, or one, one of these places where you can go to easily create a design and probably have to outsource the manufacturing so with a company like Seed or, or something like that. Um, I think that's going to be the more likely path over the next few years, and hopefully the tools grow up and it makes it easier for uh, you know, obvious or a small maker to you know, actually create an electronic product for much cheaper than they could do today. Well, it's definitely an exciting space, and uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time today. We're already a little bit over, which we could keep going, but uh, we should do it again. And thank you. <laughs>